Hey, this is Danny Ramos. Welcome to Hispanic Speak Out TV, and it's brought to you every week on Spectrum Cable Television, and soon, hopefully by April, on CBS throughout the counties in Central Florida. We've been on the air for like 15, 16 years now, bringing community news um, that's not biased. Everybody knows media has turned journalism into a platform for personal or political agendas. So we've been able to stay on the air. We don't have political agendas. Anybody who wants to come on to this show who's a politician, who's running for office, is welcome to do that. We provide equal time. So all you have to do is get in touch with us, um, wnha.tv and Gmail. And today we have a gentleman with us who's running for the United States Congress. The district that he's running in is primarily Seminole County, but that also tails into parts of Orange County, which includes um, uh, Maitland and some other parts, but mostly Seminole. And he is running against Stephanie Murphy, who um, ran against Micah and won against Micah. So uh, his name is uh, Bill Garlington, and uh, we're here to find out who he is and what he's all about. Welcome. Thank you. Thank How you. How are you? I'm very okay, well. Okay. So you who so much. is Bill Garlington? Well, you you are a guy who is. I know. Well, by the way, I know him for many years. So I know a little bit about him, but you have to know more about him. So tell us about you, Bill. Well, I'm an entrepreneur, businessman. I uh, have been in um, Orlando since 2000. I've been in the district that I'm running against Stephanie Murphy since 2004, which is uh, District 7, which you're correct. It, it involves all of Seminole County. That's Longwood, that's Sanford, that's Maitland, but it also involves Orange County, like Winter Park. Um, it also in, involves um, uh, Castleberry, and some other some other areas. Okay, in, in our so I know that you are not running on the Republican line. Obviously, you're running against Stephanie Murphy. Correct. So she's a Democrat. Right. So you want to take her out of office. You want to take her position. What has made you run in that district against Stephanie Murphy? I'm deciding to run in 2020, this November, is because the system is broken. I am a political author of It's Your Choice America, and, and also a, um, uh, this book called Common Sense, which was published last year. It's six principles to save America from implosion. So I'm a conservative. So I'm running against Stephanie Murphy because the system is broken in Washington. If I, want, if I thought the system was broken in a statewide race, I would run for a statewide race. So to send people like myself, which is a non, who's non-politician, um, I'm not going to, I'm going to turn myself out uh, if, if that, if term limits is not an issue on the ballot, but I'm going there to straighten out the, the swamp, if you will, and I believe not only the Democratic Party, who in my opinion is liberal, progressive, socialistic, and uh, it's just going to be a mess if we continue to uh, send Democrats like Stephanie Murphy back to Washington. Okay. Specifically on some of the issues. Um, um, that Stephanie Murphy has that you don't. Where do you stand on some of these issues that we've spoken about? Uh, let's talk about things like educational programs, uh, free education for everybody. How do you feel about that? I'm against free education for everybody. I mean, we've all been looking at the presidential, Democratic side presidential debates where you've got 90% of all those candidates running for president now uh, leaning towards socialistic values. They'll say, like a, a Joe Biden or a Mayor Pete, that they're, they're the centrists or the moderates. But in fact, the Democratic Party, in my opinion, represents open borders. That, free, that's a real critical issue, open abso borders. Absolutely. Okay. And, and that's a sensitive issue with Hispanics particularly. Right. Okay, the open border thing is a battleground for Hispanics in Central Florida as well as the country. Correct. And um, so what do you really think about why they want open borders. The Democratic Party, because I've studied these people for many years, the Democratic Party wants open borders so that they can pander to the low information voter, the illegal immigrant, and they, they want sanctuaries all over, and they want no e-verify, if you will, even though they say they do, but they want it for one reason only, and that's to continue to keep their power over the people. Okay. So open borders uh, does, uh, means more Democratic voters? Do you Correct. Think? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. So, and, so in that particular instance, on open, you're for closing the border down? Correct. If you're not coming in legally, you're not coming in? 
You go to you go through the system. That is correct. In other words, if you come here illegally, you will be you know taken care of you know within the laws that are on the books right now. And that is you know we've got to vet those individuals coming because America is a is a country. We all say it. It's a country of immigrants. But let's come the the legal way. And so I support President Trump's uh, border wall. I, I, I support uh, many of the politicians of E-Verify. I support uh, finding individual business owners who illegally hire immigrants because it's taking away from the Hispanic community, the black communities, these low jobs where they could have gone to legal Americans and they're being handed over to illegal Americans. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not for open borders at all because that's not going to be an America that I'm used to. Okay, um, in Central Florida, there's a lot of representation, a lot of conflict about the border situation, because there is a lot of Hispanics that believe in that, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of Hispanics, you know, so that you know, not all Hispanics support open borders, you know, uh, and, and a lot of people, like the Mexican community, don't support open borders because they came here legally, right? and they're working and through the process. Correct. And they're, you know, working legally, they came legally. So they really don't like the idea that if they waited online for six years, that somebody just crosses over and then gets financial support. Right. You know, because now Democrats are, are offering financial support. Right. To people who come illegally. I don't blame them. I would yeah. be upset, too, if I went yeah. through it legally. And now that I've got my, uh, you know, legal you know, status. What do, what do you think we should do about sanctuary cities? I don't believe in sanctuary cities. They should be eliminated. We should let ICE do their job to go after the illegal immigrants. That doesn't mean that we're the bad guy. That means that we're protecting the current 300 million legal Americans so that Americans can prosper. Okay. Let's go to another subject. This is a real good one. Okay. Okay. I see that you want to eliminate, get this, okay, get this. He wants to eliminate the IRS. Correct. Okay. So explain to us what would be the replacement if there would be one, can the IRS. Okay. okay. There has been, for the last 10 or 15 years, a, a bill that's been kicked around called the fair tax. The fair tax is what we call the consumable tax. So I know a lot of people supported the flat tax back in 2016 on the Republican side. That's a step forward. But the fair tax would eliminate all corporate tax. It would eliminate the taxes of individual, like what we pay into Social Security, like the, the FICA. It would eliminate, you know, the excise taxes. So basically how it works, in a nutshell, I'm not an expert expert, but let's just say using raw numbers, 25% would be taxed on a product that you bought. So if you bought something for $100, that in reality is going to cost you $125. So that $25 is separated in three ways. Number one, a percentage goes to the federal government. Number two, it goes to the state in which it was purchased. And number three, it would go to the county in which it was purchased. Those taxes would go and be dispersed. Okay? So there would be no filing of taxes Correct. anymore to the federal government. Correct. Wow. <laughs> that's a big bite. And that's a bureaucracy that is so big right. that you get pushed back by the bureaucracy because it's become so institutionalized. Right. You know who the bureaucracy is? It's the House Ways and Means Committee. Okay, and I believe Stephanie Murphy, correct me if I'm, sits on that. So the House Ways and Means Committee is the most powerful committee in Washington. Okay, they hold the purse string of what does and goes, you know, to the wayside. And the one thing that they do not want to eliminate is the IRS. Why? Because they continue having their power over the people. I'm for the people of this country. That's why I'm running, because I believe in Americanism equals or is capital, uh, conservatism. That's mm -hmm. what Americanism is. That's our movement. That's our name brand. So to, to get back with mm -hmm. you, so to, to wrap this all up, how we would pay for all this is been people purchase something, so if somebody they would pay the tax. So someone who's low income, with right. low capacity, right. would pay less. Correct. Based upon what they buy. Correct. And somebody who goes out and buys a $2 million yacht Correct. would pay an extra $500,000 on that yacht. Correct. Okay, because he has the money to do so. Correct. Okay, all right. Uh, what about school choice? Where are you on, on schools? Okay, I believe in, by the, if I am elected, I believe the federal government, if everything you know, lined up, that the federal government should be cut by 60% 
by 2040. Okay. 2040. Okay. So what that means is we need to eliminate programs like the NEA, the National Education Association, the EPA, and all these other, you know, corporations within the federal government and send them back down to the states. On top of that, I want to repeal the 16th Amendment that you talked about, the IRS, but also the 17th Amendment, which is basically how we elect our United States senators. Both of those bills came in in 1913. This has been really the biggest issue of the growth of the federal government, and it all happened in the turn of the century, and it really hit zenith in 1913. Okay, so what? So you're talking about term limits as well? You're talking about term limits? Correct. You're for term limits? Correct. And how do you break down those term limits? Okay. In Congress, yeah. Senate, U.S. Senators? Right, okay. And does it filter down to... Um, local position. Okay, local. real quick, uh, term limits have been kicked around since, as far as I know, since New Gingrich and its contract with America. Yeah, I, so think, I think Ted Cruz is trying to introduce, introduce or he's trying to introduce you. Senator about Scott that. and Ted Cruz. So real quick is, I would, I would term myself out, and here's how a United States House Representative would be termed out. No more than six years, okay? And then for you Congress. Got, for Congress. For House Representatives. Okay. Go do something else, and you can always come back, but no more than six years. Okay, consecutive. Okay. Then for United States Senate, 12 years, but instead of every six years that they run, you break it down every four years that they run. So, you know, it's a total of 12 years, but after 12 years as a United States Senator, you're termed out. Yeah. The president currently is two terms of eight years. Mine would be two terms of 10 years. So each term would be five years. And for Supreme Court justices, this is a biggie, instead of lifetime appointments, <coughs> term them out every 20 years, which is essential at a generation. Mm -hmm. These lifetime appointments to U.S. judges, Supreme Court judges, it, it doesn't make any sense. They don't keep up with the changing society. Right, because America is about change. If, if 40 years from now, America wants to go, hopefully they, they want to continue in the conservative way, but if they want to go helter-skelter and vote nine liberal, progressive, socialistic people involved, okay, at least they'd be there for 20 years, not for 40 years. Mm -hmm. All right, that's really, really interesting. Um, one more thing before we go, and it's a very controversial subject, which you have to, you need a lot of time to talk about this, but we'll just introduce it now because we only got two minutes. Real quick, abortion. Real quick abortion. I believe that abortion, Roe v. Wade, needs to be overturned. I believe with all the science that we have now, when a woman it becomes pregnant, she basically has now given up for at least nine months or ten months the right to term out a living organism. We can debate whether it's not, but with all the science, this organism. So I'm, I'm, I'm against abortion of any kind. Even at the very beginning. Even, in other words, late-term abortion is one issue. That's an issue. Uh, before 20 weeks is another issue. Right. My, so are you talking about from, the, from inception? Correct. When inception happens, and again, my daughter's pregnant, she's going to have a baby in three weeks. So when she went to the doctor, let's just say three weeks when she, you know, you know, that happened, to me, that doctor told my daughter that she was pregnant. From that day, she should not even think about having an abortion. Okay, well, you know what? We ran out of time on the segment. I want you to come back next week because I think the abortion thing is particularly interesting to the Hispanic community, and I want to continue that subject because I think it's one of the big ones that are going to be, there's going to be an open battle on that. Uh, I'm Danny Ramos, and with Bill Garlington, who's going to be back next week, um, we'll uh, take a break right now. Thinking used car? Finally, there's a place just for you. Motor Trend Orlando, the all-new used car superstore. All makes, all models, all certified, all at one place. Hundreds of vehicles. Toyota, Honda, Nissan, Ford, Chevy, Lexus. All makes, all models. Prices up to 65% off original MSRP. All Motor Trend certified vehicles. Finally, the name you can trust in used cars. Motor Trend Orlando. Check it out at mtorlando.com or visit our 35,000-foot indoor showroom today. Motor Trend Orlando single year because she's in foster care because her father abused her and her mother her mother couldn't believe her she is the child I am for I am a volunteer child advocate I am you Florida residents call toll-free 866 
3411425. Hi, I'm Jose Miranda. This is the Spanish Speak on TV. I'm here tonight with the one and only John Cortez. How are you, sir? How are you doing, sir? Pleasure. A pleasure. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. You too. And uh, of uh, District 43, you're uh, running for uh, a new office. Yes, sir. And that office is? I see all the clerk of courts. Okay. Um, tell me why you're changing. Well, uh, I have my mother's in the nursing home. She has Alzheimer's, and uh, I want to be close by for her. Also, my wife doesn't like the long trips of two and a half months missing me, and when I go to committee weeks for weeks at a time. Sure. And uh, I, knew, I want to be closer to the, to the area. I figured I could do more in my area right. than what I've been doing in Tallahassee, even though I've been doing a good job to, to, my, to what I think I've been doing. Right. But it's much harder up there to uh, get things done. It's really... Is it's it because it's be, so bipartisan? Yes, exactly. And oh. we're the minority, so minority really doesn't get that much to... Uh, change. Change. Okay. What's the future look like for the Democratic Party here in, in, in Florida? Well, I'm hoping uh, we change to do things correct for everybody, not just think of uh, certain things. Like, for instance, wages, schools, um, uh, employment, uh, and uh, any th things that we used to do, the party used to do in, in the 60s and 70s, which right. was unions, and get the middle class where they're supposed to be, okay. and uh, help out the poor. Well, let's talk a minute about a minimum wage. Minimum wage is, is, has a big discussion about it. People say that if you pay somebody, for example, $15 an hour, you're hurting the business, and you're hurting business in general. Is that, what do you think about that? I don't think it's true because if people have money to spend, then it helps the economy. So I don't understand how they could say that. Plus, right now they're working two or three jobs, and it's more than $15, and they still can't, can't get above water because rents are $1,200, $1,400, $1,600. Right. They have to give three months security deposit, which is uh, nobody has on nine bucks an hour or 10 bucks an hour. Sure. And then everybody's living in a house. I don't know if you've seen it. There, it's like 15 cars in the driveway because everybody's living at home because yeah. they can't afford to live on their own. That's true, too. So I don't, I don't know how they could say that. But if you give me 15 bucks and I have two jobs at 15 bucks, that's $30. Right. So I can live a little better and I can, you know, and the economy progresses because everybody goes out to eat and do things and buy stuff that they need. You don't, you don't buy the, the fact that if I, I'm giving you $15 an hour uh, as a minimum wage, it's going to cut down on the people coming in through the door because they're not going to be able to afford that restaurant anymore. No, because the, the restaurants are already raising prices without even it being $15 an hour. And if you see it right now, you go to a restaurant right now, McDonald's used to be $5 and Burger King. Right. Now they're almost like, what, $10, $12. Yeah. So, so what are you saying? They're not $15 yet. Right, and, and, but that's, the goal here is $15 a minimum yeah. uh, an hour, right? It's a start because uh, actually you need like, what was it, uh, was, uh, the, the study they did, it was $22, $25 an hour? Uh, that's not going to happen. And that's not going to happen. Uh, it should, but it's not. Yeah, yeah you're right. Exactly. You're also an advocate of education as well. I know you're, you're a big oh, advocate well. of that. What's, what's changing, what's being added? Here well, now? we have now six-tier system. We have uh, public schools. Charter schools, schools of hope. Uh, uh, what was the other one they want to have? The, the empowerment one. Then you have the virtual school. Right. And then you have, we're paying for private schools. So you're paying for private schools. When I was in New York, living in New York, I used to pay private schools out of my pocket. Right. So if, according to the way they raised the, the cost of living or the, the limit, it's 80, 000, if you're making $80,000, you're still going to get vouchers to take, send your kids to private school. Really? When we used to pay out of our pocket. Yeah, yeah. So you, you got six tiers. And then, you, I don't know if you saw the study they just had on, they were talking about, that they were giving money for all these charter schools and they're never opened. And they took all that money and that money disappeared. Wow. So, you know, so, so who are you helping? Instead of throwing money at stuff, why don't we fix it and vet the stuff and make sure they're using it what it's supposed to be done instead of just throwing money at, money at things. I only recently, much to my chagrin, um, found out that uh, teachers in private schools don't have to be licensed to teach. That's right. That kind of threw me for a loop because I, I just assumed everybody was from an even playing field, and it's not. Are we depriving then the private teachers of equal pay well, versus the rest of the system? Well, schools, the teachers have to be almost like in doctor degrees to be a teacher. Right. So, so these guys don't have to do that. They save all that money, and the, those who are doing it with the doctorate programs, 
they got a, they got those loans they have to pay back, and they're not cheap anymore. I'm still paying a forty-seven thousand dollar loan since two thousand and nine, and it hasn't gone down. It's still forty-seven thousand dollars. Wow. So what's that tell you? So imagine these folks who would be becoming doctors, teachers, and everything else still right. have to pay these student loans back, and you're going to put somebody in there because they have to have a license, and they can just go teach. Wow. My hands. What have you found in your your you, you've been in this about six years? I think six years. Okay. My six, it started my sixth year. Um, what have you found have been the biggest obstacles for you to be successful? In the well, I, haven't, I haven't produced a bill yet. I've co-sponsored bills, but I haven't produced a bill yet because they don't want to hear my bills. Okay. And I have a, I have a big HOA problem in my area. And that's, I've been doing that for the last five, now my six years, trying to fight right. HOAs to get them you know, responsible to help people, to, to stop taking people's homes right. and stop uh, giving them fines you know, and things like that just to, so they can add and add and add and a lawyer's fees and then they take your house. Right. I've been trying to fight that for the last six years, especially in Point Siena, which has 27,000, 8,000 units. Okay. I mean, 800 units. And they've been, doing, they've been this, with this problem for 40 years. And now I've got everybody coming to me about HOA problems. Because even from Miami to Jackson, they'll come down and ask to talk to me. Or even on the phone. Why has H HOAs are all over the United States, but it seems prevalent in Florida as though they're gangsters almost? I call it the, the HOA mafia. <laughs> <laughs> because it, 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 matter of fact, even yesterday I, I, uh, I went to the court system and I talked to three judges and we talked about what can I do to fix this problem? Mm. And they gave me some kind of help, but they couldn't give me help that I needed because it wouldn't be, it, it's against the law for them to do that. But they gave me a guidance on certain things, but it's still not going to do anything that I really wanted to do. Sure. Because it's so complicated and, and people don't have money to pay for lawyers. That is the biggest problem. They do not have the money to pay for lawyers. It could, uh, once you get a call with a lawyer, it's $275. Sure. And then it keeps on going up. And then if you lose, you got to pay the the fee. The, the CAM right. or the association right. plus all, your, all the fees. Right. And if you win, then you'll get something. But why have they become so powerful? Why have they been allowed because so I can't, so if I would have got bills passed, it right. wouldn't happen. Okay. But now it looks like everybody's having this problem, and I think they might get bills after I leave. It's okay. sad to say that I'll be gone when they do it, but I'm glad something will be passed. Sure. Because I want to see people help, because this is the whole idea of becoming a legislator. The, does this affect more minorities, or is it across the board? This is across the board. Okay. But mostly minority neighborhoods are really, really affected. But it's really, a, I could say it's really not just to be just a racial thing, it's across the board. You know, I wasn't trying to be racial. I just no, what I'm saying, but I'm just saying, because people yeah. think it's racial, no, but it's not. Yeah. It's really across the board. Okay, so I got everybody's every, feeling Everybody pinched. under the sun coming to see me. Right. Like all races, all colors. So it's really that. But minorities have a little more effect because most of minorities don't have that kind of money to get a lawyer. So they don't fight it. And they lose. And they lose. And they lose the house as lose well. Lose the house well. And then they're homeless. Right. Or they're living with the family, somebody else. Right. Well, living in the motels that we have in the 192 here in Kissimmee. Okay. There's a lot of things going on uh, in the last couple of days and stuff. How does that affect local politics? Local politics is going to be the same. I don't think it's going to affect anything. Okay. Because uh, you still have, he still has to get impeached by the Senate. Right. And if the Senate doesn't impeach him, he'll just be in there again, all over again. So sure. it'll be like he never was impeached. But he'll just have it on his, it'll be a blemish on him. Right. But he'll still be there. It's Business like as usual. Business as usual. Okay. Um, where do you see uh, the education system in the next you know, two, three years? Well, if we don't stop and, and do what we're doing and vetting folks, yeah. because you got to remember, we're, we're trying to give teachers raises right now. These teachers haven't had a raise in 20 years. Okay. And $47,000 from 20 years that you've been working, and then you're going to give it to the new guys coming in, and the old guy's going to get the same thing, but he should have got more, but you're going to give 47000 to the new guy who just came in. Right. And their analogy is, oh, well, the new guys, we need some kind of incentive for them to stay. Right. Yeah, that's nice, but how about the guys who've been there that have been, uh, what do you call that, turned, turned not turned out, tenured. Yeah, tenured. Yeah. And they're not getting any, any good raises. They're going to start, they already start leaving now. They're leaving now to go somewhere else, and they're not even going to the teaching field. They're going somewhere else. How do we retain teachers then? We've got to pay them right, treat them well, but not just throw money at things like I tell them. But if you're going to keep a teacher, give them what they deserve according to what they study for. I mean, they didn't just become teachers. To, they, they become teachers because they want to help kids out, too. Okay. Because they got a lot of heart, and they take stuff out of their own pocket right. and pay for stuff. But teachers need to be respected. They don't give them no respect. 
and they, need, and they needed to be treated right. I think they should be having at least 51,000, 55,000 if they're tenured. When they're coming in, 45,000 starting until they get until they reach that. Because in New York, it's uh, every time they do a contract, it's uh, let's say uh, three-year contracts, one percent, two percent, one percent. Things all three, 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 two, 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 or zero, 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 one right. percent. But you're giving them a raise. It's not like you're not giving them a raise, but okay. you're, you're also helping them out the things that they got to do, sick time, things like that. They're involved. So you know, to me, more respect than anything towards towards an employee. Okay. We, even the state employees now, they're, they're not getting good raises in the state employees right. that I work with. And they're asking me for a raise too, because they can't afford to live on, on one. Look, I don't know if you saw the special 60 Minutes on Seattle. The lady's a postal worker. She's living in an RV, because she can't afford it. She's a postal worker. It's a good paying job. Yes, that's what I'm saying. And, and now she's going to move out of the state because she can't afford to live there. She has to go somewhere else. And the RV was right on the street in front of private homes. So what's that tell you? How the, the the homeless situation is over there? Wow, yeah. I know I didn't see that article. Yeah, it was pretty good. Okay, um, I, I read somewhere uh, a statement uh, from one of the top politicians about policing that if we don't start to respect, uh, paraphrasing, if we don't start to uh, to respect police officers, then assume that at some point you may not have police officers respond to you. Well, you, 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 you're underpaying them now. So if you're disrespecting them and, and, and every time they go and they're, all, they're considered racist, killers, and all that stuff, mm -hmm. who wants to be a cop then? Mm -hmm. And you even have videotapes and, and you're seeing some of the things that are going on. And then, I don't know if you saw the other day, uh, the guy in New York that kept on driving his car back and forth in traffic. The officers wouldn't shoot at him because they, they figured the consequences, they're on video. Mm -hmm. And they're going to say, oh, he just shot him just for heck of it. But no, the guy's running the car at you which you, by law, can't shoot him. If it's coming at you. That's right, because right. right. it's being used as a weapon. Right. But, you know, there's, there's so many things that people, you know, they're scared to do, and they're scared, and that's the number one. People don't want to be teachers, don't want to be cops anymore. And now you have correction officers. I was a correction officer. Right. They're, they're uh, underpaid here, and, no, and, there's no, and it's going to be- And they're also privatized. And they're privatized, and there's a shortage of jobs, and the jails are privatized. You think these guys are going to want to get, a little, get rid of their customers instead of releasing them early? So they don't have to be in jail? No, they're not going to do that because they're making money off of them. Right. How do, how do, we, how do we address that then? We can't throw money at it. No, we, you see, everything everybody thinks throwing money at stuff is the answer. No, the answer is not throwing money. The money is sitting down, communicating with those who have experience, those who are working there, and let's get solutions. And then talk to everybody around us. So say, okay, how is this state doing? How is this county doing it? Let's talk together and find out how to fix it. Right. Let's not just throw money at things. That's the bad problem we do. We throw money at stuff and we don't find out how to fix it. I hear. We have another issue as well. Um, we have a lot of kids, um, going back to the education aspect, we have a lot of kids that are still operating in what, I, what used to be called turnkey. Uh, parents. Uh, parents, okay. And there's no, there's no after school programs and stuff like that. How are we trying to address that going forward? Or have we abandoned it totally? Well, I, from the, my, my Boys and Girls Club is, is overcrowded. And so, they, believe me, they try the best to keep those kids there happy, and they love going there. Right. Because they get to use computers, do their homework, get help, hang out, you know, things like that, and then go home. And another thing is they can't get there because of transportation. Right. With transportation, here stinks. Yeah, it does. So, you know, you have, if you don't have a car, you know, you know it's, now we got the train, thank God, you know, but the train doesn't work on the weekends. Right. It doesn't keep anybody busy. And it needs to expand as it well. It needs to expand, but everything is money. So if we don't allocate money for transportation, then that goes out the window. But as far as getting, when I was a kid, we had after school programs we went to. Right. We had the one till six o'clock or five o'clock. I think it was four, you know, five, six o'clock. We went home. Then the teenagers went from six to 10 in the gyms in the schools. Right. And they used them. And that was, you know, that was recreational. But that, that helped out a lot because it kept them, you know, keep them busy and kept them out of trouble. Sure. But we, we uh, it's like I said, we don't sit down. We don't talk to anybody, we don't talk to experts, we don't talk to 